Madeline Tian's first book of fiction, Simple Recipes, published when she was 26, won four awards in Canada, was the finalist for a regional Commonwealth Writers' Prize for Best First Book, and was named a notable book by the Kiriyama Pacific Rim Book Prize. Her debut novel, Certainty, is scheduled for publication in the U.S. and the U.K., and in countries around the world. Originally from Vancouver, Madeline Tien currently lives in Quebec City with her husband, Willem. Welcome to the Bibliophile. Thank you very much. The Bibliophile is on the radio, which is, to quote one of your characters, <laughs> the medium of imagination. And that's because the listener has to fill in the gaps. Yes, uh, that's a phrase that I think has been bandied around a lot by uh, older radio producers, but it, it was a form for experimentation with sound and with what could be done with space and recording space and sound. I love the medium of radio, and I have always felt like if I could choose another career, it would be radio, which is why I really got a kick out of being able to write about it as if I had. <laughs> Because Gail was a radio yes, a producer, producer. Doc, yes, yes, okay, in your book. Yes, and she certainty stops being a producer and, and becomes a radio feature maker. Well, I've come to this relatively late in life, <laughs> midlife at least, and I can tell you it's my favorite medium, just because it relies, as you've said. <laughs> on the participation of the listener to an extent that other mediums yes. uh, don't. They sort of fill in the blanks. It's a bit like what Bertrand Russell said once about uh, making sure that your kids experience boredom. Because if you did that, then they would develop their imaginations. That's right. You go to Disney, there's no room for that. Yes. In, in some ways, when just when you were describing it, it reminded me actually of books. In some ways, you could say that as mediums, they're very similar because there are certain uh, concrete things that are made available, but you have to, you have to engage in that world in order to... Uh, take part in the experience. As I mentioned, I haven't been able to read your entire novel or anywhere near as much of it as I will, mm -hmm. just based on what I have read. Um, I'd like to look at some of the, the text, as I said before, sure. closely, and, um, and talk about it. Your very first phrase in what was to have been the future. Mm -hmm just puts one in a lovely sort of confused future, past, present quandary, mm -hmm. just in those first seven or eight words. Yes, I, you know, I, it just came that sentence. I had been working on another part of the book, was a, which was, I'd been playing with the idea that of, um, of the future, well, how should I put it? I guess it was the idea that our ideas for the future are also kind of memory in the way that we, we plan for them, we visualize them, we, we work towards them. It, it, it almost returns to us as a memory of something imagined, you know, something not quite experienced, but something to be. And I think because of time, the movement of time, memory, th those are those are all very important parts of the book, so it felt like the right opening line. I think in my experience, one of the best things you can do is just eliminate time from your life. If you can do that, that that's a pretty good trick. Yes, if you can do that. I, I, I was thinking I'd like to eliminate wanting to be certain about anything from my life, and uh, I think it's almost the same kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Leonardo da Vinci had something to say about certainty that I want to quote to you. And I get it from one of these best-selling, <laughs> but it's actually much better than it sounds. Yes. The book's called How to Think Like Leonardo da Vinci, <laughs> Seven Steps to Genius Every Day. I recommend it by Michael Gelb. Wow. First of all, Gelb quotes arts critic E. H. Gombrich is saying about the Mona Lisa. Everyone who has ever tried to draw or scribble a face knows that what we call its expression rests mainly in two features, the corners of the mouth 
and the corners of the eyes. Now it is precisely these parts which Leonardo has left deliberately indistinct by letting them merge into a soft shadow. That is why we are never quite certain in what mood Mona Lisa is really looking at us. And I just want to f skip to this, Mona Lisa's true identity, regardless of Mona Lisa's true identity. Per perhaps Mo the Mona Lisa is Leonardo's soul portrait. Regardless of Mona Lisa's true identity, she illuminates the essential place of paradox in da Vinci's world view. In the past, a high tolerance for uncertainty was a quality to be found only in great geniuses like Leonardo. As change accelerates, we now find that ambiguity multiplies and illusions of certainty become more difficult to maintain. The ability to thrive with ambiguity must become part of our everyday lives. Poise in the face of paradox is a key not only to effectiveness, but to sanity in a rapidly changing world. That's pretty much it, isn't it? It's, it's very reminiscent of the Bertrand Russell, in fact, that idea of uh, to live without certainty yet without being paraly paralyzed by hesitancy that you have to not just live with the ambiguity, but it has to... <laughs> you have, well, how, how would you say it? I guess it's not that you want to incorporate it into your life, it's just that the ambiguity exists mm. and you exist. You don't want it to, to paralyze you, yes. I don't think, with fear. Yes, yes. If you can eliminate that. Mm hmm mm hmm did you, um, speaking of the future, when you wrote your first stories, mm -hmm. did you envision yourself as becoming a world-renowned author because of what you'd written? Were you, when you wrote it, did you know it was great? I knew that it, I, be I believed it was good. I didn't believe it was great. I believed that there was a certain kind of book I was looking for during a certain time in my life that I could not find. And uh, I tried to write that book. And because I ha had an idea of the kind of book that would be, I think the book that I did write, of course, falls short of, of, of what I imagined. Or it has to, otherwise you'll quit writing. Absolutely. Greatness, no, because if there's... I think... You'll leave it up to Stephen Page to call <laughs> There are very few great books. There are a lot of very, very, very good books. Okay, what are the few great books? <laughs> I think the only way that I can answer that is to think about the books that have really floored me, and not in the sense of, of the wow of the the style or or the or the technique, but in in the I have to go back and rethink many things in light of what I've just read. And so novels of ideas. Novels of ideas, but it's very hard for novels to reach that that level because they're doing many things in addition to putting, engaging in a discussion about ideas. And in a way that, you know, I, I was thinking when I first started to think about that question, when you just asked it, I, 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 the first books that came into my, my head were, were nonfiction books. Which, uh, sorry for interrupting, mm -hmm. but this is what strikes me about your novel. I read it, and it's giving me all sorts of neat information about, and I assume it's factual, <laughs> about the workings of the brain, for example. Yes. So you're choosing a, a fictional setting to place these fascinating ideas. Yes. Yeah, I think there was a point when I was writing the book when I wondered if 
if what I really needed to be doing was journalism or writing nonfiction or researching other things because I, I didn't I didn't want to lose touch with the, the present reality you know I didn't want to I, I love the universe that the universes that fiction makes but just in living my own life I also really want to be grounded in where I am now so I didn't do those things partly because I, I didn't go into nonfiction because I it's not my strength you it's know not how your to passion do. perhaps or is it? <laughs> I don't know. I don't yeah. think I figured it out yet. Yeah, well, you're so young. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so How old are you, if you don't mind my asking? I'm 31. Yeah, about uh, on the, about three weeks from 32. <laughs> Almost over the hill. <laughs> I, I, what, are we, what are we supposed to live to these days? 90? Is that the new... Oh my gosh. Is that the new 50? Is that the new 50? <laughs> So I guess in in lieu of writing nonfiction, I guess the 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 next possibility was to try and push fiction to to do what I wanted it to do. While you're talking, I'm thinking about Tolstoy's discussion of history in War and Peace. I haven't read it. These are fascinating ideas that he plonks mm -hmm. right in the middle of his great novel. You still haven't told me your great novel. I think because I don't know. I, I guess... I won't put you on the spot. No, and, and I mean, I'm thinking... Uh, there's a book in my, my head, and the book I'm thinking of, of is Six Note Bones, All Souls Day. Um, and he's a Dutch writer. He's... Uh, but I'm still sort of going in my over my in through my head. Is this a great novel? Well, I think each novel probably is. Each novel has its flaws. I mean, yes. Stendhal's *The Red and the Black* was, I think, one of the most brilliant novels ever written. But it ends with a rather catastrophic crash that doesn't really do justice. And same with mm -hmm. a lot of what Dostoevsky wrote. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He wrote it, be he just finished it up really quickly because he needed the cash. <laughs> That's right. It doesn't mean they're not brilliant novels. No, I absolutely agree. And, and, and those flaws are very, uh, whatever flaws may be in these novels, they're illuminating, you know? And, and as you say, too, in your work, uh, about a life that's been taken abruptly, mm -hmm. we, the remaining, feel the need to finish it, just like perhaps a complete novel. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm doing a lot of the talking, even though I'm I know I like. Here. I really. I'm very glad about that because I'm finding it very interesting. <laughs> Let's uh, perhaps, if we could, if I could get you to talk or describe the work, if you could give us a, a quick overview, the, mm -hmm. the kind that you've probably done thousands of times. In fact, I haven't, so this is, <laughs> I will do my best. It's, uh, I think of it as an ensemble novel. It has uh, six or seven characters, and it, I, I think of the novel as multiple solitudes that touch. And it's set partly in the Second World War uh, in a town called Sandagan in British North Borneo. Which and is now? It's now East Malaysia. And that, I guess, is, the, is, is our doorway. The, the, through this character, I, I think this is the doorway into the lives of the rest of the characters. And in a... You know, I... It's it's actually very very difficult for me to try and, and um, articulate something about the novel. Yeah. Quickly. If you could perhaps give us a yeah. just give us a sort of a if if it's possible. Yes. Like a plot. Who, who is it? Okay. Uh, you know, and I, I do want to. Yes. Uh, we don't have to be. You don't have to take too long with okay. that, because I do want to get back to uh, the very beginning of the novel okay. and and, and the specifically the text, which I think is the most important thing we can do. Okay. Okay, so it begins with a young boy, Matthew Lim, his memories of the Second World War in British North Borneo, and particularly one day after the war is finished. 
Um, his father is a collaborator, collaborating with the Japanese. And he, he has a very particular friendship with a young girl named Ani who's been orphaned. Uh, the novel moves a lot in time and space, so we eventually move to Matthew's wife, Clara. They immigrate to Canada. They have a daughter named Gail, who's a radio documentary maker. And she has a lot of unanswered questions, and she also has a, a sort of a, a pull to, to, to figure things out, which leads her to the Netherlands, where she finds a man named Sipke Vermeulen, who's a war photographer. But the novel starts with Gail's death. Yes, it does. Which... Uh which I want to look at because it's a fascinating place to start. Mm -hmm. Because you have one of your characters early on suggesting, I think his, na his name is Ed, and he's at one of these lovely dinner parties where there's lots of clever exchange. <laughs> and Ed says, at some point when they figured everything out, the new kind of human being may have to live without mystery. And I wonder where that will lead us. And I find it fascinating that the book begins with the mystery that I'd be surprised if we figure out. Which is death? Yes. I agree. There, I'm sure there are some scientists who would say that in all likelihood that mystery has been figured out. Um, what happens after we die? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Because if your consciousness and your memories are, are a product of a, of a biological thing, your mind and its interaction with your body, once those physical parts of yourself no longer function, there's really no reason to believe that the things that were made possible by the physical interactions of, the, of your body and mind should continue to exist. That would be a certain people's point of view, I think. And um, Yours? I don't know. I'm probably a, a, a fairly uh, straightforward agnostic. <laughs> um, You're not a Unitarian. No, <laughs> no, no. Were you there last night? No, I wasn't. No, okay. But, but Unitarians have been described by my father-in-law as scared agnostics. Really? That's very interesting. I'm a scared. In a agnostic. humorous vein. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a terrified agnostic. <laughs> um, Covering their. <laughs> they're yes. doing Pascal's. Uh, what do you call it? Wager? Pascal's <laughs> wager. Which is, hey, we don't know, so I I just better cover yes, my face. Yes, yes, exactly, exactly. So you're terrified? Yeah, I'd say so. I'd say so. So you believe something could happen after death that's terrifying? Yes. Yes, that's right. Yeah, I was just thinking of that idea of, of living without mystery. But I actually think the mystery in itself provides so much consolation that uh, I do wonder what people w would have if they lived without mystery. I, I'm not sure that would be... Well, I don't know. It wouldn't be anything motivating us. <laughs> There's a beautiful passage in uh, Virginia Woolf's uh, To the Lighthouse. Yes, To the Lighthouse. About uh, one of the characters is a scientist, too. Mm -hmm. He knows he's, he only gets sort of, if, if it's a question of working your way through the alphabet, he's come to the realization that he's, he's only going to make it to G or H. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it's not, not too pleasant for him. Yeah, that's right. That's a good way of saying it. You're Asian. Mm hmm Canadian. Yes. You have a beautiful voice with <laughs> such a... Zen-like quality. Thank you. And um, I'm reminded of, uh, as I've read the first part of your book, of that lovely film, and I think it's Korean. It's mm -hmm. something like spring, winter, summer. Yes, I've seen those, yeah. And you talk about a snowflake in a beautiful way, and I'd like you to read it. Okay. And then I've got all sorts of questions about it for you. Okay. But I, I think that that's just part of it, but you may know better than I. And let's just move it. Yeah. Okay. I think that's it, actually. He's talking about how the, the snowflake is the perfect example of sensitive dependence on initial conditions. 
um, and a character asks him to explain, and he can he says that the shape of a snowflake is the precise record of all the changing weather conditions it has experienced on its way to the ground, things like temperature, humidity, or impurities in the atmosphere, but mostly temperature. And the other character says, so people were right all along, no two are ever the same. Hansel nods, smiling. Each addition to the crystal is dependent on the exact second of its formation and its place in the atmosphere. Even a difference as small as a breath or a nudge will give rise to another shape, another sequence of order and complexity. So that's pretty much it, yeah. It speaks to the unique nature of each snowflake. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But I was, uh, I was uh, put in mind of just just as conditions and events that take place at very specific developmental stages mm -hmm. with each and every one of us That's in our right. childhood um, very specific you know like at age one if certain things don't happen apparently or two or three and a half then <laughs> if they do happen that's terrific mm -hmm. but if they don't then they form our character mm -hmm. and um, if these are unhealthy then it takes us a whole lifetime to undo them. Mm -hmm. That's right. Are you yeah. thinking about it? I, in, 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 a, in a sort of parallel way and I think um, at, when I was writing that I, I had in mind I was thinking I had sort of a long ongoing thought in my head about 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 fate and personal choice and history and that idea of where we start which is a complete you know for 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 from our own personal point of view a complete chance occurrence where how and when we yeah, were given to whom yes exactly yes. you mean there but for the grace of god exactly yes and and given that given that something you can accept that that, that that may be pure chance. It is. It's a, a certain confluence of things coming together over which you you are not a part of. They happen before you're born. Given that, what are you going to do with it? Well, I think too, though, that before you're born, mm -hmm. sure. Yeah. After you're born. Again. As a kid, mm -hmm. you don't have any control. You just sort of take it. That's right. And then it only happens when you become a functioning, thinking, reflective human being capable of taking actions on yes, their own. Yes, that's right. Because I think there's a string of time in there, in childhood and adolescence, where you are that contemplative, thinking human being, but you, you do not necessarily have control over uh, what you can do to ameliorate those circumstances. So... You mentioned one of your characters, Clara, again. In her own life, Clara has witnessed acts of selflessness, of empathy whose motivations she does not doubt. She knows that a single act, a choice, can transform all that came before. Long ago, when she was young, she risked her future on this belief. What does that mean? <laughs> yeah, you know, I'm sure I went back and wondered that same thing <laughs> several times. Um, it has a literal, literal meaning in the book, but at the same time, it, it, it it's very... Um, reflective of the kind of person she is. She, she, she has a very strong faith in the person that she married and um, she has a strong faith that... Faith that in the person that she married, what? That's good for her? That person is good for her? That that person at his core is a good person. That all the actions he has taken, well not all, but that he's made important decisions for purely selfless reasons. Which is something that, just to get back to our conversation about the concentration camps mm -hmm. in Hong Kong, mm -hmm. and uh, I'd mentioned that my grandfather was in there and probably wouldn't have survived if he hadn't have been involved in a love affair. Mm -hmm. That people in those conditions can't act selflessly. It is very rare for them to be able to do that and they know what they're risking if they choose to act selflessly they may end up risking their own survival but doesn't that you're right it's rare mm -hmm. but there are quite a few examples of people who have put the lives of others ahead of their own yes I absolutely 
that sort of strand in the novel about, and it, does, it, it doesn't really go anywhere in the novel, but it was something I was thinking about a lot, was altruism and empathy and where it comes from. I mean, I think that people like Richard Dawkins have, I think there's even a quote from Dawkins in there about, uh, we'll ha- we have to teach goodness and generosity because that, I don't, I can't quite remember how he phrases it. Do you know where it is? Yeah. Incidentally, we have here the Canadian edition, which for us collectors following the flag is the true first edition because you make mention, it it makes mention on the dust jacket of the fact that, so it's almost proof that this is the first edition because it says right here that her debut novel, Certainty, is scheduled for production in the US and the UK and in countries around the world, which means this is the true first. This is the true first. So this is the one I'm going to get you to sign. Yes, absolutely. Okay, here's the Richard Dawkins quote. He says, Let us try to teach generosity and altruism because we are born selfish. And I think he follows up that argument basically by saying that biologically speaking, we should not be wired for altruism unless it will bring about some greater survival of the species. But individual altruism, it takes some figuring out from a scientific point of view because it doesn't further the survival of the individual. Mm -hmm. Uh, My grandfather, who lived through the experience, Mm -hmm. talked quite frequently of enlightened Mm self-interest. That's one thing. Yes, enlightened self-interest. And uh, also, if you're not, this this gets to, to the core of Christianity, you know, if you're not happy in yourself, mm-hmm. you're miserable in yourself, but what good are you going to be to anyone else? And also, further along, it's better to give than to receive. You do feel quite a bit better when you give than you receive. But maybe not, not enough to, <laughs> yes, to give up your know, life. I, I, I've read that too, and I think I read a scientific study where they said that doing good acts, uh, charitable acts, gives a rush to the brain in the same way that eating chocolate does. <laughs> <laughs> but you just have read it? You haven't experienced it? Oh, I, I have experienced it. But, you know, it's kind of hard. I mean, I don't think we think about us. Well, we don't often stop, stop and think of ourselves as purely biological creatures. Sometimes we do. But <laughs> Men cross more than women. <laughs> I think we do the things that because you know may, we may tell ourselves because it's the right thing to do and it feels right so that's that's that and um but i don't think we do it because we get the the high or this you know that whatever whatever's happening in the in the mind yeah i mean it's not so obviously it's not a, sort of an immediate gratification it's not like lust it's i mean it's mm-hmm. not like uh, fulfilling an appetite mm-hmm. but once you've got those things covered off then it's much easier to uh, to go after this other kind of buzz, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. this other altruistic buzz, but it's, just, it's both this hierarchy of needs to uh, business. Yes, that's right. Mm. So you're happy with this novel then? Yeah, actually I, I, I am, and I'm really surprised to be able to say that. <laughs> but I'm really happy. Because you're your own worst critic. I'm a pretty harsh critic of myself, mm. and, and you know, someone should be. <laughs> you think anyone out there is good enough to be mm. your critic? Oh, absolutely. Who? Do you have anyone? Do you have anyone that criticizes uh, constructively what you do in a way that changes the stuff that you write significantly? Uh, well, the, the person who has worked on this book for two years is my editor, and she is very, she really... Uh, What's her name? Ellen Seligman. She, Ellen Seligman? Yes, she, and she was intensely involved in this book. She really took it on uh, on a very personal level. And But, you know, prior to publication, the only people who had read it were my husband and Ellen. And between those two very different kinds of people, my husband's a scientist, so uh, he, he, he approaches it very differently than Ellen is does. Who's so what kind of changes were made specifically? Uh, obviously, you aren't going to let anything go out that you're not Absolutely. pleased with, or at least you know, to the point where you're not going to let anything go out that isn't better than what you originally showed up with. Yes. Any yes. particular parts of the book that 
that happened in? The major change that happened was a change in the last couple of chapters. I only realized it in hindsight, but I had written a novel in which I had set set everything out for a particular kind of convergence. And then at the last minute, I kind of veered away and went in another direction. Can you be more specific? Yep. In the end, at the end of the book, it's, is it okay for me to give away? I probably shouldn't give away. Can I give away the ending? It's your call. <laughs> <laughs> I know I'm a kind of a father figure here because I'm about 20 years older than you are, <laughs> but not quite, actually. Let's say 15. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but you certainly clearly don't have to ask my permission. <laughs> well, well, but I'm flattered. <laughs> basically, there's Wait a minute, a, a, maybe a, I shouldn't be flattered. Because <laughs> you're treating me like some authority figure, right? I want to be treated more like a, an equal, well, like yeah, a, a fellow rebel. Yes. Well, <laughs> <laughs> uh, then you, yeah, but you don't know what my standards of rebellion are. They? <laughs> you don't know if you really. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, they're probably the easiest way to say it is that two characters who I always felt would meet in this book never do, and they did in the initial draft. And their meeting was a. a what I thought at the time was crucial to the way the book unfolded. But as the years, I mean, it really was years went by, and I I thought about it, and, and my editor had some very specific comments to make about that meeting, and another meeting that doesn't take place, and which now does. And, uh, and I saw that she was right, because I saw that I had set everything up for a particular convergent, convergence, and then I had kind of walked away from it. So there is such a thing as right and wrong, then? (laughs) Different kinds of books, you know? In a way, it it, it really would have changed the kind of book it was, because you kind of know the kind of book I mean that sort of seems to be going somewhere in a particular, to a particular place, and then veers off in the hope that the detour is actually going to shed much more light on everything that's come to pass. Mm-hmm. And then then there's the kind of novel that simply follows its conclusion, it follows its premise through to the very end. Mm-hmm. And in the end, that, that was the right choice for this book. I, I just, I had to follow it through to the end. By right, then, you mean that it felt right. It wasn't, there's not a right and wrong here. It's just this is, you look back and you say, Ah, this is almost, the, this is the way that it was supposed to be created. Yes, and maybe that... This was the purpose of it. This was the purpose I've of it. I've given life in the, in the, quote, right way. Yes, yes. And, it, and if you hadn't have done that, it wouldn't have been, you wouldn't have felt... No, I don't think it would have felt right. right. <laughs> okay. You, you talk about the fact your, your husband's a scientist, mm-hmm. uh, and as I say, the thing that I found striking and captivating in your book, in addition to the sort of um, Asian, kind of mm-hmm. sparse, beautiful prose as it deals with nature and food, and was the play of ideas. And specifically, you, you've done a lot of research into warfare mm-hmm. and science and neuroscience. Can you share any insight into the nature of warfare in two sentences with me? (laughs) The honest answer is probably no. (laughs) Um, I think after reading a lot about conflicts, reading a lot about the prisoner of war camps, reading a lot about um, the genocides that have taken place since the Second World War, I felt a strong need to write about the aftermath, which is why in in the book, the Second World War is crucial to the book, but it really is only about 50 pages of the 300, because it's about the events that spiral out from that, and that war doesn't end with the generation that goes through it. Uh, of course, they, they're suffering, you know, there's, it, it, it's, there are really no words for it, and... And, in, in, sorry to interrupt, but the impact, both on the front line, obviously that's pretty tangible mm-hmm. and bloody, mm-hmm. but the impact on 
my parents' generation is just as devastating, but it's not visible. The psychological devastation that, and our generation just doesn't doesn't appreciate it. Yes. We, we're, we're still living through it, though, because our parents were so, to quote Philip Larkin, fucked up. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's right, and I, 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 and I think what we really can't see is the potential for certain people that was lost forever because of the the traumatic experiences they had in the war and um, the character of Matthew in this novel. So he's only nine when the war happens, and the potential for what he might have been is lost forever from 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 that moment. He's reshaped entirely. And that's never going to be anything you can measure because it's just the way that a life unfolds. But um, I think it's even more striking. You know, at least we are we are grappling with the history of the Second World War. But in my reading, it it really it, it I, I wondered about these ge- these generations coming after. Um, Pol Pot in Cambodia, the kind of devastation that they, they've had to internalize and live with, um, or the, Ra- the Rwandan genocide. And we're dealing with it in different ways now. There's a lot more of the, the, these criminal courts and the, the um, Truth and Reconciliation Committees, but it, 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 I think it's all part of the aftermath. And um, interesting in my conversation with Stephen Page, Mm -hmm. who's the CEO of Faber, who has picked up the rights to your book in England or around the world? In uh, UK, Australia, New Zealand. Stephen and I talk about the fact that the Second World War is so fresh in our minds that it's almost as if our parents' generation, our generation, we're stunned, and, and it's only now, and I think this is where it hasn't been mined yet, and it sounds to me that you're on the, on the, to, to use this silly term, you know, the, the leading wave of it. And, and yet it could be the, the cusp of where it ends, because our generation is, is it, well, it's, it's our parents and our grandparents who lived through this war, but my children, uh, the children of my contemporaries, they, they will never have had that contact. So as much as we're still so deeply it, it, grappling with it, it may, end, it may all end here, and, and I think... So That's it, fascinating because what you're saying, if I hear you correctly, is that the readership, the, 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 the audience, for this story is drying up and dying. Is that what you're saying? And I think I'm saying both the readership and those who need to write about it. Um, or can, with or any can. direct sort of deep emotional... Yes. And it's, figure. as always, it's the, the things closest to us in history are, are going to feel the most relevant to the present. And as the Second World War gets further back, it, it will feel less relevant to a younger generation. Um, but the devastation of that war and the things that happened that had never happened before and that which we said never again, it is, it is really, really slipping away from us. The fact that you don't think that... Uh you don't think that we will be able to remember or future generations, you think they're doomed to repeat the past? I think they may be doomed to repeat the past if if they feel it is not relevant to them. And, I, and you can already see, see how it could happen in that um, the current generation, let's say with the, um, the Japanese prisoner of war camps, well, this has never really been dealt with in Japan as a historical fact. And oh, sorry, they're, um, they're not, they haven't gone through this sort of terrible public humiliation for their behavior that the Germans have had yes. to go through. Is that what you're suggesting? That's, that's what I'm. Yes, definitely. And it is not only is it not 
recognized that, that Japan was the aggressor nation in that part of the world in the Second World War. Uh, it, it's not recognized, it's forgotten, it's not passed on, and so I think there is a tendency for, for, for people to feel that it could not happen here. Wherever here is, this could here could be anywhere. Those people, or grandparents, they <laughs> their lives were not that different from ours, and political instability as it is, these things are not uh, impossible, you know, and the, the Second World War, it, it, just in a, in a legal sense, in an international law sense, it's, it's begun a lot of things to stop what happened in the Second World War from happening again. Um, so we have that. Th these are the sorts of things we're building up to prevent these things from happening again. But it is very much in our minds, you know, that we have so much at stake in the society that we're creating with each other. And uh, it, it's probably an overused phrase these days, but you do have to be vigilant uh, in your society. You have to take care of your democracy. We also keep, you have to keep alive the experience and, and memories yes. of those that uh, have, have gone through the kinds of events and situations that one would never want repeated. That's right. Just in closing, I'm talking to Madeline Tian, who is the author of the novel Certainty that has been met with rave reviews and also all sorts of squabbles around the world as to who's going to pay the most for the rights. And Stephen Page at Faber, the company that uh, won the rights, won the bidding war, uh, speaks, I think, more articulately and with more emotion than most <laughs> most literary uh, critics could possibly ever speak. Uh, I played that excerpt for you from our interview, Stephen's interview. How'd that make you feel? I actually... <laughs> I had a very emotional response. I, I, I had tears come to my eyes. You know, in some sense, and I'm stepping outside of me speaking as a writer, but as a person, there was so much uh, from my publisher. There was, there was a lot of faith that I could write a book that was what... How, how would I put it? The, Sorry, from your Canadian publisher? From my Canadian publisher. Okay. They just had faith in this book. They had, and from the beginning, from the very first drafts. This is, this is, sorry, this is uh, Colin, Colin Stewart. Colin Stewart, yeah. yeah. And Wonderful, <laughs> deeply rooted, oh, yes. very Canadian company. Yes, yes. As a writer, I, there were things I wanted to accomplish, but as a person, I'm... It, it sounds foolish, and it does sound childish, but I wanted to live up to the, the faith they had put in me. And to hear, to, he, to know that they're proud to be publishing this book means, means a lot to me. And to hear that from Stephen as well, that they are, they are proud to be publishing this book, and that they too came to it with expectation, and, and that the expectations were met for them, that, that means a lot because this this book is incredibly important to me because of the different things it draws from my own life and 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 the ways in which I imagine them. No other book that I write is going to be is is going to mean the same thing that this this book does to me. Just because it puts you on the stage and it's it's vindicated you and it's made uh, those people that have taken risks on your behalf. It, it's sort of. Uh, Yes, and and the the sort of root of it, the man who clamors with the Japanese and is murdered, it's not the story of my grandfather, but it's very, very similar to it. And so it's a story I've been carrying around for a long time. And, and you hesitate with stories like that because when you write it, you want to get it right because you're only going to do it once. You want to get it right and you also want to do justice yes, to your family. that's right. That's right. It's an honor to have met you. Thank you very much. I've been speaking with uh, Madeline Tian, and she's the uh, she's the author of uh, Certainty, published by McLaren and Stewart in Canada and Faber in the rest of the world, English-speaking world. <laughs> Thanks again.